All right, good afternoon, everybody. It is at 2 o'clock, so I guess we'll get started on time. They, they like when we do that sometimes. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Abby Huffman. I'm Director of Programs and Events here at the Adams County Historical Society. So excited to see so many of you here. Some faces that I know, some that I don't know. It's a very gloomy day outside, so it's nice to see some of you come inside for an inside program, which is really neat. Um, a couple of things real quick. Mark your calendars March 14th. For those of you that follow our YouTube page, we will be posting a virtual video. We'll basically be going live virtually, giving you a program. It's about Camp Sharp during World War II, Gettysburg's Camp Sharp. And the title of the program is The Psycho Boys. That was their, their nickname. Um, the talk's going to be led by Dr. Beverly Eady, or Eddie. I apologize. I always mess up her name, and I can never remember if it's Eddie or Edie. Uh, but she's going to be giving a wonderful talk and program Thursday. It is going to be virtual on YouTube. Please, if you show up here, I will not be here. The door will be locked. So please, uh, it'll be at 7 o'clock on our YouTube channel. So please feel free to check in for that. And then we do still have tickets left to our special live event with Ken Burns on April 5th. If you didn't hear, Ken Burns is coming for another film festival. A lot of folks have gotten excited and already gotten their tickets. There are tickets left to the Friday night, April 5th event at the Gettysburg High School, not here, at the high school. And he's going to be talking about Lincoln, reflecting on Lincoln. So if you'd like to see Ken Burns and come out and get a chance to see him speak live on stage, there will be a film component as well as him personally being on stage talking to you. That's April 5th, 7 p.m. Get your tickets. I strongly suggest it. They're selling, and they're going to sell out eventually. So please make sure you sign up for that. Now today specifically, I want to talk to you about the Shriver House Museum. When I was 18 years old, I walked into the Shriver House Museum answering an ad in the newspaper that said about something about being a tour guide and telling the you know, getting to tell, give tours and that sort of thing. I had no experience in the tour guide world, and I told Nancy as such, I am interested, I'm passionate, and I'm clueless. And apparently she thought that was a great thing, because I've been there ever since. <laughs> so it's really a special place in my heart to have Miss Nancy come and speak to you today. She's been a great mentor, a great friend to me over the years, and today she's going to give you a special presentation about her baby, uh, the Shriver House Museum. So if you would please welcome Ms. Nancy Goodmistead, she'll come speak to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am so excited to be here. Um, I talk a lot, and I tend to go off into all different tangents, so I try to make myself a little list of things that I'm supposed to be talking about in a certain order. Um, when Abby applied for the job, I said, I am not hiring some 17-year-old to do this. She'll never be able to do it. So I asked her a couple of questions. For example, I said, so if you see this man and he's leaning on the walls and we've asked him six times not to lean on the walls, what are you going to do? Oh, sir, we're trying to preserve the house. Could you please not lean on the wall? I was like, well, that's pretty good. And she can do it. Yes, sir. Well, people don't often say that to me. Can I speak up? But yes, I will. <laughs> I'm happy to do so. Um, I want to thank Andrew Dalton for inviting me here today. I want to thank Abby for all of her help in putting this together. Um, I like my tours to be fun because if history can't be fun, it's not going to, it's really no fun at all. Um, I also like it to be informal. If you have any questions while I'm talking, don't hesitate, just scream it out, and if I can answer it, I'll be very happy to do so. Um, we are the Schreiber House Museum. We are the civilian experience at Gettysburg. Uh, the museum opened in 1996, and really we were the very first people in town to explore the civilian experience. I meet people here in town every day, and they say, what do you do? And I said, I work at the Schreiber House. Oh, what is that? They have absolutely no clue what it is. There is nothing special about the Schreiber House when you drive down the street. There's nothing that grabs your eye and say, oh, man, i got to check that place out. But once you understand a little bit about it, to me, in my heart, I truly believe it is probably the most important building in town. It's the most intact. The Wills House is wonderful, but it's not original. Barnesworth has been altered a lot, a lot of times. There's so many great buildings in town. But the wonderful thing about this one is it is fully intact from 1860. And I think that um, I was lucky, but I think we are all very, very lucky to have such an important uh, building. Um, my, hist my, tour, or my story isn't a Civil War story. Uh, for everything that you folks know about the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War, I couldn't fit on my little finger. If all the streets in town were not named after generals, I would have no idea who the generals were that fought here in the battle after General Lee and General Meade. Um, but so I want to tell you my story, 
how we came to be here and how the Shriver House came to be. Um, this is, where am I here? First one and it's not working. Got to turn it on, that helps. There we go. My story starts in Philadelphia, where I was born and raised. This picture has absolutely nothing to do with this, but it is my favorite photograph of myself. You know when you look in the newspaper and you see a picture of um, a woman who looks like she's in her 30s and you think, oh, how sad that she died. And then you read the obituary and it says she's 97 years old. Well, when I die, my husband, I made him sign a piece of paper. This is the picture that I want in the obituary, okay? When you see some little girl, I want you to feel so sad, and I hope that she's 98 years old when she dies. Uh, but it was Nancy Wilson at the time. I was not Nancy Wilson, good Miss Deb. So I was born, born and raised in Philadelphia, went to school, went to college, uh, grew up and got a job. I worked in computer sales. I had a bunch of jobs, but the last job I had was in computer sales. And I met a boy, and his name is Dell, and we got married. So now I am Nancy Wilson, good Miss Deb. To be honest, Goodman said is kind of a tough name. It's Norwegian. I be Irish. Uh, when we got married, I begged my husband to take my last name. And he said, it sounds like a football player. And I said, what's wrong with that? Dale Wilson sounds awesome. But he was way too macho, so I got stuck with Goodman's dead. While we were dating, uh, one weekend, we decided to go camping down at the Blue Ridge one October. So we went camping for the weekend, and on the way home, we were driving up Route 15, and we saw a sign that said Gettysburg, and we both just said that neither of us had ever been there. We said, oh, let's just you know, pull off and see what it looks like. So we pulled off, we came all the way in Emmitsburg Road, we got to the traffic light there, we made a left up Baltimore Street, and if you ever watched that movie, um, Miracle on 34th Street, at the very end of the movie with, with little girls yelling, oh, pull over, pull over, pull over, that's the house, that's Santa Claus, I told him I wanted, that's the house, that's the house. So as we're driving up Baltimore Street, I yelled, oh my God, pull over, pull over, pull over, look at that gorgeous house, that beautiful fixer upper. And my husband turned to look at it and he kept looking at me and looking at the house, he said, are you talking about the green piece of crap, but he didn't say crap. Um, I said, yeah, yeah, use your imagination. Get rid of the paint, put shutters back up on there, maybe uh, window boxes in front of that house. That could be absolutely beautiful. And he just looked at me and he said, you are crazy. And so we just continued driving. We went back to Philadelphia and went back to work selling computers. And uh, back in those days, we really didn't sell computers. We sold word processing. And for older folks, we know what word processing is. Back in those days, I sold a $13,000 piece of equipment that did Word. That was it, nothing else, just Word. Um, but I sold a lot of them. We did pretty well with that. But it was high tech at the time. But in those days, companies were coming and going and coming and going because everything kept developing. And eventually, we got PCs, so you didn't need just one piece of equipment that did Word. Uh, so we had been fired from several companies because they went out of business. And finally, we decided, you know what? If we can sell for somebody else, why don't we do something for ourselves? Why do we have to do it for somebody else? Because we're doing OK at this. And we racked our brains for a long time trying to decide what we could do. So one night, we watched a little bit too much of the old Bob Newhart show where he had a bed and breakfast. And we said, well, hey, we could do that. We'd never stayed at a bed and breakfast. The only one we knew of was the one on the Bob Newhart show. Um, but I thought, we could do that. But where are we going to do this? We looked at houses all up and down the East Coast, down in Cape May, New Jersey, up in New England, and New Bern. We looked at a ton of houses. Well, in the meantime, we had friends from our area that had moved out to Bigleville, and we used to come to visit them all the time. And we were talking about it, and they said, well, geez, why don't you do it in Gettysburg? We're like, Phew really? Gettysburg? There aren't any here. And no, I don't think so. But then we started looking at houses and doing some research. And we were these young business yuppies. And we, were, uh, we didn't pick Gettysburg because of the history. Our business plan said we needed so many tourists. They had the national park here. It was a college town. Uh, so Gettysburg sort of made sense. So after some research, we found an absolutely gorgeous house. It is the, called, we called it the Old Appleford Inn. It's at 218 Carlisle Street. Uh, if you're not familiar with where it is, remember the house that caught fire a few months ago at uh, Carlisle and Water Street? Well, we were two doors down from that, a big, beautiful white house. 
I had dinner in that house that burned down for, oh God, a hundred times when we lived there because our neighbors were good friends and that was a real sad thing. But this house was magnificent. I mean, we were, I was 30 years old, I had no idea what we were doing. This had 10 original bedrooms, five fireplaces, a 2,000 square foot carriage house in the back uh, that we got to turn into a, a whole home for ourselves. It was fantastic. And we opened up the very first one in Gettysburg. Everybody thought we were nuts. And uh, we thought we ripped off these country bumpkins <laughs> because we got such a steal on this house comparing to what houses were going for, say, on the main line in Philadelphia and down in Cape May, New Jersey. I mean, this was a steal. So we thought we just made out so great. Little did know, we know after we got settled in and made fr some friends here, we found out that everybody in town was laughing at those two idiots that paid more for a house than anyone had ever paid in all of Gettysburg. But it didn't matter. We were happy, so that's all that really counted. And at the time, we were the premier place in, in Gettysburg. There was nothing else like it. And it is a magnificent home on the inside. It's just gorgeous. So uh, when any big dignitaries came to town. The Gettysburg Hotel wasn't built yet. Uh, we got to host uh, Charlton Heston and his whole entire family. Um, Chief Justice Rehnquist came and stayed with us. Billy Joel was this close and had to cancel. But So we had a great old time here. Um, there was only one thing we didn't realize when we bought the house, because we were young and stupid. We were so enamored by this magnificent house. It was surrounded by three fraternity houses. Yeah, everybody does that exact same thing. It was four years of hell. <laughs> I had brothers their age, these college kids. So part of me wanted to go over to the fraternities and go to the parties, but also we were trying to do the big girl thing, and then so that didn't work out. Um, we would call the police because of the party that was going on until 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and the police would say, geez, I'm sorry, that's a college program or problem, we'd call the college and they'd say, yeah, sorry, they're not on campus, so that's a borough problem. And guess who was stuck in the middle? And so we talked to the police quite a lot that, at that time, and we tried making friends with the kids, and uh, every year when the kids would all come back to school, we'd wait about a month or so, and then we would invite the presidents and vice presidents of the three fraternities that sat around us for dinner. And we would make roast turkey and mashed potatoes and muffins and all kinds of wonderful things. And we'd all sit around the table, Dell and I and the kids, and we'd say, uh, oh, yeah, you know, before we eat, let me just talk, because they were now eating fraternity food for the last month or so. We'd say, let's, let's just talk about a few things. We want to set up a few rules here. We talked about how long we would put up with the noise and this. Uh, well, we were just kidding ourselves because it didn't do a darn bit of good. And so they were nice and they were fun, but it was hard to make a living. Our sign there, the old Epiphone Inn bed breakfast sign, if any of you know of Virginia McLaughlin, she used to live in Fairfield. She's an itinerant artist and she's very famous. She did uh, the, in, the mural on the inside of the GAR building. Virginia did that. She did a number of other things here in town. But uh, she painted that sign for us and I just fell in love with it. And it still hangs in my office today because I took it with me. I knew it would be with me forever. But one of the things we realized when we had the bed and breakfast is every morning, We'd have 10 or 12 people sitting around the breakfast table, and all the discussions would be about General Lee and the wheat field and the peach orchard and all that. But nobody ever talked about the people who lived here. Uh, there were the one name always came up when you talked about the civilians, Jenny Wade, great story. Uh, some people knew about John Burns, who happens to be my favorite guy in town. Uh, but I would ask people in town and, and, my, and our guests about other citizens, and they had no clue. And Del and I thought that was really kind of a shame because uh, we started doing some reading and there were a lot of great stories, sad stories, funny stories, just interesting stories, but nobody was telling them. And we're like, oh well, that's too bad. But when we decided we had enough of the inn after four years, um, we had a list on our refrigerator of things. We liked Gettysburg and we wanted to stay here, but we wanted to make a living. And so we had a list of things that we could do. We were gonna open up a cheese shop, uh, all different kinds of things. And we finally had one idea that kept coming up to the top. It was something that locals could do, tourists could do. Uh, at, when we first moved here at the inn, uh, people would ask us, what can we do tonight? And we would say, well, there's the movies, which they could do at home, or 
Jim Getty. We sent everybody to see Jim Getty because he had a, a, a shop or a, a studio at that time, a theater at that time, and he put on a great show and everybody loved him. But after that, there really wasn't anything for people to do and everything was done at seven o'clock. So we were looking for something that locals could do that was also open in the evening as well. We came up with the idea and then we needed some place to do it. So we started looking around. We needed a couple of acres and uh, we found a place. It was outside on Baltimore Pike, um, just beyond the new visitor center, about a quarter of a mile past it. On, when you go out Baltimore Pike, it's on the left-hand side. It was Krause's Junkyard. Does anybody remember that? Oh, I understand, it was a total mess. Yeah, it was gone before we moved here. This is not what it looked like when we bought the property. Uh, it had been a junkyard for many, many years. Uh, somebody, some people know who this park ranger is, which I think is kind of interesting. I don't, I don't know who it is, I don't remember his name, but some people do remember him. Um, but it was a mess, it was just absolutely disgusting. And when we decided what we were going to do, we were going to build a miniature golf course. It was something that everybody could do, locals, tourists, we were open at night. When I told people when we first opened that we were going to be open till midnight, they're like, what are you kidding? People don't go out that late at night here in Gettysburg. Well, every night we were turning people away at 11, 30, 12 o'clock because there was nothing else to do here in town. So that was lots and lots of fun. We had a great, it was, we were scared to death when we were building it. We invested way more money than we had. Uh, it was a long, it was a, one of the rainiest, rainiest springs ever in town. So Dell would form up a golf hole, get it all ready to pour the concrete the next day. It would rain cats and dogs and they'd have to pour it up and do it all over again. So it was a lot of heartache and we were scared to death that nobody would come once we opened, but they did. And it was pretty nice. About a year into it, one day I was sitting upstairs in our office looking out at the golf course and looking kind of forlorn and Dell said, what's wrong? And I said, oh, nothing. <laughs> he said, seriously, what's wrong? I said, you know, I'm bored. He's like, what? He said, he sort of was bored too. This worked, we were happy, but building it was one thing, running it, that part was kind of boring. So um, we were thinking, well, what else could we do? We could do something else here in town. And we went back to that old idea that we had at the Apple Ford Inn and people knew what happened on the battlefield, but do you know what happened to the families and their homes in town? We decided we were gonna look for a house, fix it up to make it look like the 1860s, and tell the stories of all different families around town and what they went through during the fighting. Well, we looked at a lot of houses, and, uh, but actually there aren't too many houses that come up that often on Baltimore Street. We really wanted to be on Baltimore Street because for the little bit of Civil War history that we knew, we knew that there was a barricade right built there at Breckenridge Street. We knew that this is the street that Abraham Lincoln walked down on his way to deliver the Gettysburg Address. The new visitor center had not been built yet, but this was perfect location because it was halfway between the uh, square in the center of town and the visitor center that was going to be built on, out on Baltimore Pike. So we thought this was a great location. So actually for several years, every time a house would come on the market, we would go and check it out. And we picked one house, and my husband really kind of liked it. And I said, no, it's not going to work. He said, why? It's, it's almost perfect. I said, yeah, but it's on the wrong side of the street. He said, what are you talking about? I said, it's on, it was on the east side. I said, if we have ladies in long Civil War dresses, and it's 95 degrees, and they have to stand outside to talk to people, I'm not going to ask them to stand in the hot sun. I want to be on the shady side of the street. Once again, he thought I was crazy, but it, it just seemed to make sense to me. So we didn't get that house, but we looked and looked. And one day we were out looking at houses, and I said uh, to the realtor, I said, what about that old greenhouse up the street, that old ugly one? And the realtor said, yeah, some old man owns it, and he's never going to sell it. Well, 9 a.m. the next morning, I had to go to the courthouse, and I looked it up to find out who owned the house. Well, when we built our miniature golf course, across the street, there was a little tiny greenhouse. 
It was owned by Leonard Sheeler. Some of you may know him. Leonard moved dirt from the time he was like 12 years old. He drank, drove a tank with Patton. He drove backhoes and dump trucks and all kinds of things. Well, we got to be friends, and Leonard pretty much built our golf course. He built all the big mountains that were there. He dug out all the lower spots. I mean, he was there all the time, and Leonard and I got along just great. Leonard was um, a grumpy old man. He was a curmudgeon, and, um, but there was something about him. We just got along beautifully. His wife used to always say to me, you know, the things that you say to Leonard, if his children talked to him that way, he would have a fit. But she said, I see him looking at you, and he puts on this really mad, mean face, and then this little teeny tiny smile would come out at the side. So I never had grandparents, because they were all gone. I, and so I kind of looked at him as a grandfather, and I love a curmudgeon. So we got along just, just great. Well, guess what? Leonard owned the house. What is what an amazing thing. I say this every single day. I do believe that the Shriver story was meant to be told. I just got to be the lucky duck who uncovered their story. So Dell and I went across the street one evening to see, De to see Leonard, and we laid it all out. We wanted it to look like the 1860s and you know, on and on and on. And um, would you consider selling it? Because that house would have been perfect. And Leonard listened and listened and listened, and I got all done, and I was so excited. And he listened and he said, well, nope. I'm like, oh, come on. He said, nope. And his wife told me that was going to be the answer, but uh, we tried him anyhow. So honest to God, I am not exaggerating. Over the next year, Leonard got cakes and pies and cases of beer and baseball caps and T-shirts and sweatshirts and all kinds of things. And finally one day, like a year later, he says, if, you, if I say yes, will you leave me alone? And I said, well, I'll stop bugging you, but I'll still come and visit you because I liked him. He was my friend. And I said, so could we see inside the house? Because we still had never been in. And he said, yeah, I guess so. But Leonard didn't want to go in the house. So instead, um, his wife Peg met us at the house. So we're standing there on the front porch one day in late winter. And Peg is at the door. She's trying and trying and trying to get the door open. And oh, it must have been 10 minutes, and she just could not get the door to open. So she finally said to Dell, could you try? So Dell takes the key, and he's trying and trying. And believe it or not, I ran out of things to talk about to, to Peg, because this was going on forever. And so finally I said to geez, Peg, when's the last time you were in here? And she thought about it long and hard. And just as she cracked, uh, just as Dell cracked the door, she said, well, I guess it's been close to 30 years. That's 30 years worth of junk mail sitting there on the, on the floor right there. Uh, it was an absolute disaster. I mean, it was awful. Um, these are, this, uh, let's see here, this, I have to shine it this way, don't I? That doesn't do a darn thing. Okay, this is the parlor. These are the stairs going up, up to the second floor, uh, front door. That's the center hall on the first floor where all the junky mail was. And let's see here. As we walked around that first day, I'm walking around saying, oh my God, look at that. Oh my God, oh my God. And my husband's walking around saying, oh my God, look at that. And Peg said to us, you know, you're both using the same words, but you are not saying the same thing. <laughs> so these are a couple of my favorite pictures. When we bought the house, our architect said to us uh, when we got there, oh, shoot, go back, go back. OK. Uh, our architect said there was a bump out in the wall right here. He said, I think that's a fireplace, but it looked, obviously had been sealed over. So he said, when you get in there, he said, cut a hole in the wall. If it's solid brick, don't worry about it. The house is going to be a mess. We'll patch it up later on. But he said, if it's hollow, he said, you got yourself a fireplace right there. And if you do, he said, go down to the bottom and pull up a board, he said, because you always find treats underneath an old fireplace hearth. So we cut a hole. Of course, first he cut it too high, so it did cut into brick, and we were all disappointed. And then I said, wait a minute, I think there's, it's empty under here. So we cut the hole bigger, and sure enough, it was hollow, so we had a fireplace. We pulled that up. In my hands right there, um, I found a pair of eyeglasses. And it's kind of funny. Um, this was back in the days when you got two for one or three for one when you took pictures and you got them developed. Well, 
my husband always gets excited about things like this, a find like this. So he said, hold it up and I'll take your picture. So he must have taken maybe six pictures. I'm holding it like this and like this and like this and all excited. I think we have about 48 pictures of those glasses because with all the duplicates and things like that. But we found the eyeglasses. I found a, photo a photograph in there and a couple of other little things. So, oh gosh, we were so excited. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the landing between the second floor and the attic. Uh, there had been a very serious leak in the roof for many, many years that was just unattended, so it was a real mess. Uh, this right here is, um, today we use that as a dressing room for the staff that works at the Shriver House. But it was funny, when this is small and in your hand, when I got that photo, I kept flipping it over because I couldn't figure what was the top and what was the bottom but obviously the radiator sit on the bottom. This is just the roof that was falling in up on the second floor. It really was, it was a mess. And why was it vacant for 30 years? That's a very good question. Um, it turns out Leonard Sheeler's parents owned the house. Leonard never lived in there except for a few months when he came home from World War II with his little English war bride, and he lived in one of those rooms for a couple of months. And Peg Sheeler, I hope there aren't any Sheelers in here who are going to be mad at me, but Peg told me that uh, Leonard was a real mama's boy. He would call his mother to ask her everything that he could do. And... Um, his mother and father passed away within about three or four days of each other. And she said Leonard was so distraught, he, and this was in the 1960s, I guess, uh, that Leonard decided he was never going to go back inside that house, and neither was anyone else. So over the years, many people tried to buy the house from him, but he would not sell it. The borough of Gettysburg tried to condemn the house three different times because it was in such bad disrepair. Each time, Leonard would do just enough to get by for whatever they were complaining about, but he didn't do anything better with it. Um, over the years, I've met his children, and his daughter told me when she was in grade school, if it snowed, Leonard would make her go with him to shovel the snow on the sidewalk. And she said she would always cover up as much as she could because she didn't want anybody to know that her family owned that house because she was so, so embarrassed. So that's the reason it was sitting empty. Yes? Sure. 1996. Yeah. Yep, 1996. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So these were just an awful, awful mess. And let me see here. Okay. All right. So this is some of the stuff uh, that we found. About a while before, somebody had turned the, uh, and the bedroom upstairs in the attic, the attic into a bedroom for one of their children. This is the chimney from the outside. It was collapsing. It was a mess. You see these little thingies right there? They're bullet holes. They're all patched up, and there's a bunch of them on the side of the house. So we had to repair that all up there. This is what the room looked like when we bought it. This is just, oh, I have a great story about this lath. Um, we had great contractors. It was GS&G, Donny Gantz was the contractor, and he was really great to work with. And they, they cared as much as we did about making this look as 1860s as we possibly could. So, but this wall right here from that leaky roof was just an absolute, it was just collapsing. So we had to take it down and repair it. So one day, Dell and I were not at work, which was very unusual because we were there all the time. And I came back the next day and the contractor's guys, they had taken all this lath down. I said, what did you do? And they said, well, you said you were going to cheat and put up drywall because we didn't have totally unlimited funds. So we were going to cheat here and there and put up drywall. And I said, yeah, but if we're standing in the attic and it's 1860, we can't be looking at drywall. We have to be looking at lath and plaster. So uh, this was 1996. This was the year that we got like 110 inches of snow. If anybody remembers, it just kept snowing and snowing and snowing. Uh, we had a dumpster out in the front yard or on the street in front of the house. My darling husband went into the dumpster, collected all this lath and put it back up on the walls. We decided in that day he would never have made a lather because it took him about a week. <laughs> and I'm sure those guys would have done it back in a couple of hours. So um, we put that all back the way that it really belonged. Uh, so let me see here. So this is 
the house that Dell thought was a green piece of crap. And this is what he saw when we looked at the house. This is what I saw when we looked at the house. It's hard to believe that it's the exact same house. But as I said to a few people earlier, when you drive down Baltimore Street, there is nothing that says to you, oh, look at that magnificent house. I have to go in there. It, it, it's just a plain Jane house that blends in with the rest of the street. But once you understand the story, it's just such an incredible place. But it really, it, I think it's a very, very pretty house. And it is my, um, my big doll house, actually. Let me do something right here. So once we finished the work, actually during the work, really, I needed to write a script because we wanted to have a story to tell about the people that lived in Gettysburg in the 1860s. And one of the very first things I found out is this house was built by the Shriver family. Who were the Shrivers? People ask us that every single day. And I love the answer. The Shrivers are no more important than anybody else that lived in Gettysburg in the 1860s. They're just one family who happened to have an incredible story, and this is their house, so it's their story. When we un uncovered their story, in the end we decided that their story was so extraordinary that rather than telling the stories of all different people here in town, if you're going to stand on their floorboards, you ought to hear their story. They're no more important, but they happen to have an incredible story. So the house was built by George Washington Shriver. George Shriver was born on a farm down on Marsh, by Marsh Creek. Uh, if you go down Emmonsburg Road, you make a left onto Marsh Creek Road. You go down about a mile and a half, and there's a little crook in the road. And there, tucked on the left-hand side, is this magnificent stone farmhouse that was built in 1795. It looks like it was built 10 years ago. It's just remarkably beautiful. And that is the house that George grew up and was raised in. Now, his father, his grandfather, settled that property. The Shrivers landed here in Adams County in the uh, mid to late 1700s and owned uh, a lot of property. Um, but when George Shriver was only 15, 16 years old, his father died and George inherited the property. And some of the things that were in that that he inherited, I think is pretty interesting. It was 200 acres of land, an orchard, a granary, a stone spring house, a large bank barn, the foundation is still there, but the barn is gone, a grist mill, a blacksmith shop, they produced wheat, rye, oats, corn. They had a weaver's shop, two still houses, 60 feet long, by the way. That's pretty big. Uh, and they had substantial quantities of gin, rye whiskey, and apple brandy. These people had money. In fact, in the maybe 1780s, I found an inventory that was done on the property. And that weaver's house, inside there, in, in the 1780s, they had seven spinning wheels valued at $100 a piece. That's a lot of money in the 1780s for sure. So it turns out they'd been wait, making whiskey out there by the time George got their farm for almost 100 years, leaving George a very wealthy young man here in Gettysburg. So George has got the farm. He lives there for a couple of years after his dad passes away, he and his mom. And uh, finally, he met a neighbor girl. And her, well, he probably knew her all of his life. Uh, her name was Hetty Weikert. You might know her dad, Jacob Weikert. The Jacob Weikert farm down there on Tawny Town Road. Okay, as the crow flies, it was a very short distance between their two farms. And they got married. They started a family right away. They had uh, two little girls, Sadie and Molly. At the time of the battle, they were seven and five years old. They also had a little boy who only lived about three months and he passed away. But then George decided he wanted to move into town and get rid of the farm. He didn't want to be a farmer anymore, or a gentleman farmer, I'm sure he was. But he wanted to move into town. He wanted to build a brand new house for his family, but he also wanted to open a business. And like many, many homes on Baltimore Street back in those days where people had their business in their house, but they also lived there with their family. Uh, like next door, there was a butcher shop and the family lived there. On the other side, there was a cabinet making shop, the garlic family, they lived there as well. Well, George was gonna do the same sort of thing. So he builds this beautiful house and decides he is going to open up Shriver's Saloon and Ten Pin Alley. I say it every day, I think George was way ahead of his time. So in the cellar, that's where uh, 
This is the saloon, which is downstairs in the cellar. There's my little rat that I just love. Uh, when we restored the house, we found two rat traps in the house. So I always keep a rat on the floor downstairs in the cellar. <laughs> and this is, the, this is not George's. This is just a picture of a period bowling alley. His was 14 by 65 feet, uh, 14 foot wide, 65 feet long, two lanes wide, fully enclosed. So that was a pretty nice building back in those days. And uh, let's see here. So this is the way the house looked when they built it. There were no houses on either side. This is the Tilly Pierce house that sits right on the corner of Breckenridge Street. Yep. Uh, the house where we today have a museum shop sits right here in this open space. There's the Shriver's home. There is the bowling alley in the backyard. Uh, these two houses, today there are two houses there. They, are, they were not here at the time of the battle. There's George's little orchard right there. This is the garlic house. That was the next door neighbor to the Shriver family at the time of the fighting. Okay. Uh, and inside, the house looks a little prettier than it did before. This is the parlor. Again, they were very wealthy people. Oh, and when we were restoring the house, um, the very first day that we owned the house and we came inside, I came in and it was snowing and there was a man in the big old house across the street shoveling snow. And he came over and he introduced himself and he said, are you buying this house? And we said, yeah. He said, are you gonna live here? And I said, no, not really. And he said, well, what are you gonna do? And I told him and he said, oh, are you gonna have one of these? Are you gonna do this? Are you gonna do that? And I said, yeah. And he said, you have no idea what you're doing, do you? I said, not a clue. But I knew nothing about bed and breakfast. I knew nothing about miniature golf. I knew nothing about re uh, restoring old houses or telling these stories. But in each case, we learned what we were going to do, and we, we figured it all out. So I said, I'm going to figure it all out. Well, turns out Glenn had just retired from Old Beth Page Village. It's on Long Island in New York where he had been the curator for 26 houses from the 1860s, and now he was an antique dealer. Within 30 minutes, we shook hands, and when this first opened, he furnished the whole entire thing in four months. He was a busy little boy, and he was absolutely fantastic to work with. He was spending the money like it was coming out of his own pocket. I would go out antiquing, and I found a 10-plate stove for one of the rooms, and I um, told him about it. I said, go check it out. It was only $600. And he's like, that's ridiculous. No. He said, we can do better than that. And it was one that needed a lot of work. I have time to do the work. He said, you don't have time to do that work. He said, let me look. So for example, he found a, a 10 plate stove. It's absolutely beautiful. It was made in Hanover. It's got a crack in it, but we knew we were never ever going to really actually function, you know, use it as a functioning stove. So that part didn't matter. So it looks gorgeous and it was right. So he was really, really great to work with. We fought a lot though. I mean, I would go, would go out antiquing and I'd buy some things and I'd bring them home and I'd say, oh, look what I got for Sadie's bedroom. And he would say, well, that doesn't work, take it home. I'm like, no, no, it would really look great. And I would try and sell him and he'd say, well, you can ask me five times, but the answer is still no. It does not work, it's the wrong time period. And in the end, I took his advice because he was the expert, I was not. So I got a lot of nice antiques for myself at home, um, but I trusted with it, what he put in the house. And when we first opened and I was giving tours, I love people, they're so polite. I don't want to say anything, but that chair, that's totally the wrong period. And when we first opened the museum, I never told anybody that I owned it. I just felt awkward about that. Uh, but I would always smile and say, oh, thank you. I'll mention that to the director because they didn't know who I was. Um, but in the end, I put my trust in Glenn. If he told me, I was going to go with what Glenn said. So he was, he was really great to work with. This is um, Hetty's Kitchen which was really, really fun to put together. Uh, I don't normally tell people about this, but this is the only, ah, I did it again. I'm too fast. Go back, there we go. Uh, this is the only fake fireplace in the house. It was interesting when we bought it, that at one point, this wall right here, they cut it all the way back to about a foot over here from the corner. And we stored a lot of wood in this room during the restoration. And every day I used to sit on the pile of wood, looking around, think, dreaming and things. But on the, on the wall, in that little corner there, there was a shadow. 
And I could not for the life of me figure out what that shadow was. People would come in and I'd say, hey, what do you think this is? They, they didn't know, they didn't care. And, uh, but one day, that when we bought the house, they at one point had put in those coal furnaces downstairs in the cellar where you had to put the big grate up on the second floor for the gravity-fed heating system. Well, we wanted to take those grates out. They didn't belong there. But I said to the men, I said, do me a favor. When you take it out, do not put a square patch in the floor. That's not acceptable. I said, take the boards and mingle them and mix them so it looks natural the way it was. And one day I was over at the miniature golf course and I got a phone call and it's always the same thing. <gasps> We found something interesting. Like, what did you find? As they were pulling up the boards over here in the corner, they found a hearth, the shadow, the base of a hearth. And we found uh, chicken bones and meat bones, petrified mice that are still on display in the shop, um, all kinds of things. And they, and they said, well, that's the good news. The bad news is if you want to replace it, it'll cost you $5,000. Everything costs money. And this was a long time ago, $5,000. Well, we decided we would cheat. So this is not really a real fireplace, uh, but it looks great. And we do know that they had a stove. It was in their, in oh, I forgot to say, we got an inventory here at the Historical Society. And when I worked with Glenn, we used that inventory to, furnish the to refurnish the house. So um, it gave us a great idea of the things that they had. They had a melodeon, they had a trundle beds, they had fish gigs, and everything on that inventory we have put into the house. Of course, it wasn't complete, so we finished with everything else, but it was a great basis to start with. Well, it turns out that this here was the wall where the fireplace was. From here to here, there were shadows in the wall, had green paint on it. Those were shelves originally. We cut the wood the exact same width of that wood and the thickness of that wood. We knew where to stop it. And the shadow that I was seeing was that little tiny portion here and down there of the uh, mantle. So it told us how high the mantle was. And we went to another house in town that was built the same year to find the design for this mantle. And of course, we built that mantle. Uh, if you come to the house today, the fireplaces or the stoves there, uh, my husband and I went on a house tour one where, and I'm always looking for ideas, and they had a stove and they had a red light bulb in there. I thought, oh, that's a clever idea to make it look like there's a, a fire going on in there. But of course, I always have to do it one better. So I went out in July and I bought uh, red Christmas lights and I put, you know, little teeny tiny things and put them in there. And uh, a friend of mine came for a tour one day and they, he said, oh, the red lights look great. He said, do you know what really look great? It's the flickering lights. Oh, God, couldn't get out there fast enough. And bought <laughs> so now in the couple of stoves, the two stoves that we have in the house, there are red flickering lights and they're covered with ashes and wood from the fire and stuff like that. Can I tell you how many school kids I go over and they see, they're kind of like warming their hands by the fire. And I, I love that because I want them to believe that it really is. So that is Hetty's kitchen. Uh, this is George, no, this is Sadie and Molly's bedroom. And this is where my real dollhouse shows up here. When you take a tour on, um, you can't see it here, but on the table, we have Necco wafers because Neckos were invented in 1847. So it's kind of fun to tell people about the things that are still around after all these years. This is George, this is a spare bedroom. So we have it set it up as George's office and a storage area for Hetty since they didn't have house, closets in their homes at the time. The map here, you might recognize it. It is an 1858 Adams County map. And the reason it's hanging there in that inventory that we had of the Shriver's home, in there was an 1858 Adams County map. And as I understand, when the fighting was over, there were none of those left here, very few left in town, because the Confederates were using them to find out where they were here in town. Uh, but I put that, that's a new one, so it is a reproduction. We put it in there. And, oh, man, I am just like happy fingers, as my husband calls me. Um, the quilt, one of the ladies that works at the Shriver House, Gail Underwood, you might know her because she's very active in Civil War stuff, um, is a quilter. And she didn't tell me, but she went around to all the ladies that work at the Shriver House, and she, they gave her pieces of their Civil War dresses, and she put together a Civil War period style quilt made out of all of their, the fabric from their dresses, and everybody signed it. But now every year when we have a new person start, at the end of the year, we have a thing called Festivus, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And um, 
the new people get to sign the quilt. So that I just cherish that so much because it's such. It's I just am so proud of that. And this is Hetty's sewing area here because for her it's just a bit of a storage room. So we've been telling the story for quite a few years, and we would always tell people. Um, I'll get to it, but the house was taken over by Confederate soldiers during the battle. And we talk about the aftermath of the battle, what people found here in town. And we tell a few stories about that. And it finally dawned on me, we're telling people that the house was, houses were destroyed, that people came back to find just terrible things. But to tell people is one thing, but to see it is something else. And that's the wrong slide. How about that? Let me see if I can get back to the next one because I'll come back to that. Well, let me do this and I'll go back to the other. Sorry. I'm not real high techy, okay? So this is during the restoration and this is the attic up here. And uh, these two holes here are very, very important. You all know who Tilly Pierce is. So one day when I'm doing the restoration, somebody said to me, oh gosh, have you ever read Tilly Pierce's book? She lived next door to you. And I said, no, who is Tilly Pierce? And they said, oh, you should get her book and read it. So I got her book, and I read it, and I cried my eyes out. Because Tilly Pierce was with Hetty Shriver during the battle. And Tilly wrote lots and lots of details about what they, what they went through. And I meet people in town all the time who are like so proud. My great-grandfather was here in town during the battle. <gasps> really? What happened to them? Well, I don't know, but they were here in town. Well, with Tilly's book... I got to know what happened to Hetty Shriver during the battle. And in Hetty's book, uh, well, in, during the battle, when the battle started, Hetty Shriver is 27 years old. She's got two little girls that are five and seven. Her husband is away fighting in the war. There are soldiers all over the streets out front. She was absolutely petrified, like everybody in town. What do you do at 27? You want to be back with your mom and dad. So she decides to collect her girls and go back to the par her parents' farm, the Weikert farm, where she grew up. Before she left, she talked to the Pierce family next door, told them what she was doing, and they said, well, geez, do you think maybe Tilly could go along? Because three miles away from here, it would be so much safer. And Tilly, of course, did go with Hetty. And unfortunately, though, as you all know, the Weikert Farm sits at the bottom of the hills between Big Round Top and Little Round Top, so they were jumping from the frying pan and into the fire. While Hetty's house was sitting empty, it turns out it was taken over by Confederate soldiers. Uh, this is the attic of the Shriver's home. Here, let me see if I can do right the button. And these two holes. So I read Tilly's book, and I was so excited. The next day, I went back to the house, and our brick mason, Gary, was working on the chimney. And Dell and I were standing up there, and I said, oh my god, you're not going to believe this. During the battle, Mr. Pierce in his house, he went back up into his, everybody's hiding in their cellars, but he went back up into his garret to look out the windows to watch the shooting in the streets all over the place. Well, when he did that, he happened to look out his south-facing window. He could see directly into the Shriver's attic. He said that room was filled with Confederate sharpshooters. He watched them knock these two holes through the wall. Well, when we bought the house, it was real obvious that there was something funky about those areas right there. They were kind of messy and bricks kind of shoved in there and sloppy concrete in there or mortar. And um, I, of course, knew that they had to be cannonball holes. What else could they possibly be? But um, I said, but the killer is, Mr. Pierce said, he watched the soldiers knock the bricks through the wall in the house next door on the second floor. And I said, oh my God, this is killing me because today the house next door is attached to the Shriver's home when they filled in those houses. And it's attached on the second floor. And I said, oh my God, we'll never see those holes. This is killing me. And Gary, the uh, brick mason stood up and he said, no, it's not. And I said, Gary, look out the window. It's attached to the second floor. He said, no, 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 no. In the old days, it was called the ground floor, the first floor, the second floor. So when Mr. Pierce described what was happening on the second floor of the house next door, this is the room he was talking about. So at that, Gary said, do you want me to try? We're like, sure. So he took a little teeny tiny hammer. He went over to this hole right here. He about barely tapped it. That is exactly the way it looked when all the bricks fell out. So of course, we decided to check the other one and the exact same thing. 
all the bricks fell out. And we never touched it again. So that's exactly the way it looked when we found it. Uh, we did have to put glass in there because now, and I love Dell, he says like, this is great. Now we've got these two great big holes. We got pigeons, we got bats. I said, well, we'll take care of that. And um, we couldn't use plate glass to store it up because uh, that would not hold it. It had, still had to continue to support the house. And this was actually before the internet. That's how long ago this was. But I went to a, a, a convention of sorts for people who restore old homes. And I found a company from Germany. And they worked with uh, kind of plate glass like you'd see in a bank, that real thick stuff. I don't know, because it was hard to find people. But I made little templates about the shape of those. I sent them to Germany. They cut out the glass. They sent it back. And then Gary installed those in there. So those are the originals. And I just love when people come up and say, oh, aren't you afraid the bats are going to come in there? I'm like, no, we've gotten that all taken care of. That's all patched up. So these are just some of the things that we found inside the house during the restoration. We found tons of stuff. Imagine six Tupperware containers, like those two feet high ones, uh, filled with the things that we found inside of the house. And these are just a few of the things that we found upstairs in the attic. There's a medicine bottle. There's a, a lots of liquor bottles underneath the attic floorboards, which I thought was kind of neat. It's funny, we found two um, gas lamps. And I wasn't sure if gas, I knew it was coming to town about that time, and I came up here to the Historical Society, and they helped me to say, oh, no, yeah, gas was just coming into being, being at that time. And I, we looked at the newspapers from the time, and there were lots of ads, or, if you want gas in your house, call me, and I can install the gas in there. And oddly enough, we found two gas pipes on the first floor of the Shriver House, and they were both right inside the front doors. And somebody told me the reason they were there and not all over the house. They put them there because when other people were walking up and down Baltimore Street and they look in the window, oh, look at that, the Shrivers have gas because it was a new thing, so that was pretty exciting. And we found two gas lamps underneath the attic floorboards there. And you know that photograph of uh, Lincoln coming down, the procession coming down Baltimore Street? Well, I can't remember where here in town, but somebody had it blown up huge covering a wall like this. And I stood and I stared and I stared and stared at it to get any kind of details I could find. And lo and behold, roughly in front of Mr. G's ice cream, there was a gas lamp. So yes, they did have gas at that end of town. Because when we were doing this, somebody told me, oh, no, no, gas was coming, but it wasn't that far down Baltimore Street in 1860. But apparently it was. So there was a gas lamp, which I thought was pretty exciting. Of all of the things that we found in the house, the one that touches my heart more than any is this little shoe right here. There was a custom back at this time period when a family would build a new home, they would take a shoe from a family member, they would tuck it inside the walls of the house during construction because that was supposed to bring the family good luck. Sadie and Molly Shriver were three and five years old when they moved into this house, and that surely looks like it would belong to a three or a five-year-old. People always want to know, who was it, Sadie or Molly? And I, I often think maybe it was a hand-me-down because that was a thing back in the day. Um, but I just think that's one of the most precious things. Uh, people say, oh, yeah, they did, they did that to a, um, discourage uh, bad spirits. And you could go in that direction, but I say it could bring us good luck. So I'm going to stick with that one. And by the way, I don't think any of the tour guys that work there, I don't think any of us have ever given a tour that we don't get asked the question, is the house haunted? Every tour guide knows if they say that this house is haunted, it will be the last tour that they ever get. Uh, I've been there since day one, have never had anything happen. So we all have different answers. I usually say, well, we got ripped off. We got the only house in town that doesn't have a ghost. So, and I've asked about it, you know, why do you think we don't have ghosts? Because I have evidence of the soldiers that were killed in that room. And uh, so you would think if there were going to be ghosts in a house, it would be in that house. And I've said that to a number of people who say to me, well, you know, they must have passed over happy. And I'm thinking, I'm 17 years old. I'm from a foreign place. People here are talking different than me. Somebody's shooting at me. I'm shooting at them. I get shot in the head, and I passed over happy? <laughs> I don't get that. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, so these two holes right here. Okay. One day, 
Over the years, I had a few people who kind of took me for a ride. I had a guy who said he was going to wallpaper, put back the original wallpaper in the house in a couple of the rooms, but in exchange, I had to do this and that, like show him things in the house. I must have spent six hours with this guy, uh, taking him up and down, showing him everything in the house, and turns out he was a fake. So he, was, he didn't do anything. And, but I learned my lesson from that. And so I tried to prevent that from happening in the future. And, oh, I'm going to come back to that. I can't. So the things, when we started finding things in the house, we found some other things. We found Civil War medical supplies. They were hidden underneath the attic floorboards. They were not tossed there when we picked up a floorboard. They were very neatly laid underneath the floorboard. But the most, the most, 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 most exciting thing that we found, right underneath that hole, we found six Civil War bullets. Three of them still have the gunpowder intact. Uh, the day we found them, I remember it was a February day. All that snow was out there. It was the end of the day. Most of the contractor guys were gone. But there were two guys still downstairs in the parlor. And that day, uh, we had our HVAC guys working on the heating and air conditioning system. And they were great because all, most of the contractors we that we talked to, they all wanted to build those little boxes in the corner to run the duct work. And Dell and I said, well, you have some leeway in the attic and the cellar, but in the main rooms, we didn't want to change anything. So they said, well, let's hide it under the attic floorboards. And we thought that was a great idea. So the first day they worked, they were up there for hours and hours. And at the end of the day, they left. I went upstairs, and there was one floorboard pulled off to the side. And so I thought, oh, geez, I wonder if there's anything under there. So I stick, stuck my head under, and I found one of these bullets right here. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> so I picked up the bullet. I ran, because we, all the construction guys, we talked about how cool it would be if we could find a bullet in the garden. And so I ran downstairs, and I said to them, oh, my God, oh, my God, look what I found. And they were, like, in total shock. Nobody said a word. There was no, water, no electric in the house. We started grabbing extension cords, plugging them each, into each other. The, with three of us, we ran up. We never talked. Ran up the stairs, got down on my hands and knees, shined the light under there. And there were six bullets all together. Because I said to them downstairs, if you planted that and think this is funny, if you tell me right now, we're going to laugh. If you tell me tomorrow that you did that, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw the bullets with the paper, I knew that they did not toss them under there. And I'll tell you, that night when I got in bed, I just remember looking at my fingers and thinking, imagine the last young man who touched that bullet. I was so lucky. God, that was just so exciting. And the medical supplies were very cool, too. Let's see here. OK, so one day I got a letter in the mail. And it wasn't on letterhead. It was all typed. It was from the Niagara Falls Police Department. And this man said he was a detective. And he was testing a new product called Blue Star. It was supposed to be better than Luminol. And he went all over the internet looking for a place where blood was shed in a place where it wasn't like, you know, floors washed and things over the years. that uh, pretty much sat untouched for a long time. And he found us on the, online, and he wanted to know if he could come and, and test out the product. Well, because I had been duped before, and this wasn't even on letterhead, I didn't feel real comfortable about it. So instead, I got the uh, telephone number for the Niagara Falls Police Department, and I called, and I asked for Nick, Pay, and Essa, and I'm totally expecting them to say, who? You know, there is nobody like that here. And they just said, hold on, Nick, it's for you. So Nick gets on the phone and told me he wanted to test this product and he wanted to know if he could use the Shriver house. And I was like, it was something I always wanted to do, but never ever thinking that I would have the opportunity to do such a thing. And uh, so he came down. And he came down on the moon a night when there was a no moon. He wanted it to be as black as he could. So he went up to the room and he uh, fixed up his chemicals. There he is, mixing up all of his chemicals. And he sprayed it all over the floor. And anything you see in blue is blood. Trust me, there was 10 times that amount. If you ever come to the Shriver house, if this is the wall where they were shooting, from that wall to about here in a humongous oval was solid blue. It just doesn't all show up in the photographs for some particular reason. I'm not sure who was more excited, me or him. 
He thought he won the lottery. He said, oh my God, it reacted faster, it was much brighter, it lasted much longer. He was so excited. But the coolest thing was underneath the, one of the holes, um, you could actually see the shadow of a full palm print and next to it there was a wiping motion. Someone was down on their hands and knees trying to clean up the blood. It was absolutely breathtaking. And it, it was, I, I just can't even put into words how exciting it was. And uh, there's a, a black stain on the floor up there and um, a lot of the tour guys, we discussed whether or not that was blood or whatever. He took a little sampling of it and did a test and came back and he said, no, it was tar from when they were probably working on the roof or something like that. But that was so exciting. And he also did the lady farm when he was here because people have seen theirs, which is great too. Um, but he wanted to be published because it was good for his job. And about a year later, you might have this in your files, I got a copy of Bloodstained blood stain Pattern Analysts magazine. I always have to think about that when I say that. And in there was an article that from Nick, so he was so proud, and it showed that this was, at that time, this was the oldest blood that had ever been detected in America. And so he was so excited saying, now if I go back home to a crime scene that's 50 years old, if there's one little drop of blood, I'm going to find it. So he was quite happy. And we, that night, in the attic, there was a window between those two little loopholes. And um, I said, you know, sometimes on tours, people ask, did they shoot out the window? And I, I'm not military, but it doesn't make sense to me because Mr. Pierce described those soldiers getting shot through those two loopholes. And if you could get shot through a hole this big, you're not going to want to stand in front of a window. So I, and I told him that. He said, oh, well, let's just give it a try. So he sprayed the whole entire wall. Around the window, there was not a drop. Makes sense. Around those two little openings, I am not kidding you, there were hundreds of blood spatter, little pinpoints to the size of a quarter. And, you know, if you've got your head there and you're shooting out, you got shot in the head, that bullet that comes back, it's going to be a mess. But I really love giving tours to um, the uh, ghost tour people who come through the house all the time, and, and that's great. And uh, I've had people say, oh, I can feel this man's pain. I think he got shot in the leg. And oh, I can just feel it. And I'm thinking, that's a pretty tricky shot through that little hole with his head in the way and then he got shot in the leg. But they swear by it. That's okay. <laughs> There's something for everybody. So after years of telling the story, um, we now know that this house was taken over by Confederates. They had the house for three whole days while they were here because Hetty was gone. And uh, I used to tell people that the house was destroyed after it. And it got to thinking that saying it is one thing, but seeing it is something completely different. So now, uh, when you take a tour, you come through the house, everything's great, they're wealthy, the parlor is beautiful. You go up and see their pretty bedrooms, you go up to the attic and find out the Confederates were inside the house. And then you come back downstairs and the house is destroyed. We call these the wrecked rooms. If, any, if we break a piece of china or whatever in the house, it's like, yeah, just throw it in the rec rooms. It's perfectly oh, fine. And it is, it's just so exciting because when people walk in that room, we, it's a surprise. The door is closed. When we come back downstairs, they don't see anything until they come inside the room. And just to watch the expression on people's faces. And we say all the time that, you know, this probably doesn't light a candle to what it was really like. Um, a number of years ago, there was a man who did some filming in there, and he asked me if uh, he could be pretty graphic upstairs in the attic with the soldiers getting killed. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And he brought in a nice big pool of blood. I'm like, wow, where did you get that? He said, I got it in a company in Hollywood. It's the same company that CSI and Law and & Order uses for their blood scenes. And I said, oh, will you give me the name? He said, oh, yeah, sure, I will. So he filmed there for about three days, and at the end, he said, you know, I've never seen someone so excited over a pool of blood. Do you want it? <gasps> oh, yes, I said, I do. <laughs> so we have a nice pool of blood on the floor in there. It doesn't show up in the photograph. My other favorite thing is we have a nice um, chamber pot, and it's filled up the, the top with yellow liquid. And we do a lot of school kids, and I love the school kids. This girl walked in a year or so ago, and as she walks in, she said, oh, look at that lemonade. And I said, oh, that's not lemonade. She said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. And she said, are you telling me? 
And I said, well, you know, it's been there for a long while. I said, but sometimes people who have sensitive noses, they can still smell it. It's hard to believe. And so all these seventh grade girls are going, ew, ew. It's olive oil. <laughs> the power of suggestion. Excuse me. <coughs> so we do lots of tours for lots of people, lots of adults, of course. Um, but we do a lot of students. And <coughs> they can be a challenge sometime. But the wonderful thing about doing students is they love the Schreiber House. And we all know we're old people who like history. We need to get people interested in history when they're young. We, and we also, one of the things I think at the Schreiber House is that we teach his kids that history, it doesn't have to be boring. Our tour guides, they're all hams. They make these kids have fun. And it is so much fun. They all get off the bus like, oh, God, I just went on a three-hour battlefield tour, and now they're going to make me do this. And we scare the crap out of them before they get off that bus. You touch anything, and you're back on the bus. But once we get them inside, and we get them settled down, and we get them, you know, they know the rules and this and that. You could hear a pin drop. They love the story so much. We don't, no offense to all the military people, we don't talk about dates, we don't talk about generals, we don't talk about names of battlefields or different types of cannons. We just tell them a story. And by the time this story is over, they have a very good idea of how war impacts people, whether it's Gettysburg, whether it's uh, Afghanistan or Syria or, you know, War is ugly. But the kids, I have to say, are lots and lots of fun. I really do like them. And I must say, I am very, very proud. There's a few of them here in here, in here today. I have the most amazing staff of people. I am so very, very lucky. Everybody that works here at the Schreiber House, um, I think only one or two answered an ad in the paper. Almost all the time, it's somebody who walks in the door and says, I took a tour, and I would love to tell this story. And uh, I have one woman, Gail. She is the quilter who made that quilt, uh, has been with us for 20 years. This is her 21st year. And uh, it's just such a great, great people, um, crew of women. It, we've had men from time to time. It just so happens that it's all women right now. And every year at the end of the year, I take them on a, a surprise, and we call it Festivus. You know what Festivus is from Seinfeld? It's a nothing. It's not really a holiday. And it's not, thanks, it's not Easter, it's not Christmas, it's not, and it's just the end of the year we do something different. And I always keep it a secret. They never know where we're going to go. This year, this past fall, we went up to Dill's Tavern. If you haven't been there, you need to check it out. It's absolutely incredible. And we got a wonderful, wonderful tour there. Uh, we've done Monticello. We've done behind the scenes at the Visitor Center. We've done the Eisenhower Farm, where we actually got to walk on Mamie's bathroom floor. It was very cool. But I will say my highlight, the best thing I ever did, and it will never be able to top this, is a few years ago, we went to the Library of Congress. And just us, we sat around the table. And on that table was Abraham Lincoln's Bible, the stuff that was in Abraham's Lincoln pocket when he died, the original Emancipation Proclamation, the jewelry that he bought for Mary Todd to wear to the inauguration, and, and lots of other stuff. And oh my god, I was like the queen for that. They would do anything I asked after that weekend. That was so great. <laughs> so we try. it's not always that exciting, but it's always fun, and we have a great, great time. But I am very lucky to have such caring people with me. So it isn't all about me that did this. These are the people that make the Schreiber House so wonderful. Like any museum, we do have a little gift shop. It's not real big, but I always wanted a general store, <laughs> and I'm never going to have one. So that's why it's crammed with stuff. Um, to make it look kind of crowded like a general store. But there are some cool things. This green cupboard, when we bought the Schreiber House, that, uh, there were two editions put on the back of the Schreiber House in 1905. This came from one of the kitchen editions in the back of the Schreiber House. Uh, we were over at the Schreiber House for about five years when the house next door came on the market. And we bought it, and that's where we now have our museum shop. That's where we begin and end our tours. This cupboard right here was in the summer kitchen behind that house. So I'm happy that both of these pieces are um, from the houses themselves, and I like that. OK. 
Okay. We do uh, two big programs a year, and one of them is called Confederates Take the Shriver House. We do it every year on the 4th of July, the anniversary of the battle. Um, this is our 25th year, so since the other big reenactment that's been going on forever and ever, we really are the oldest running reenactment here in town. And uh, it's just a fun, fun, exciting day. You get to see what, we get to tell st people the stories of what happened to the people during the battle. We do have Confederates upstairs in the attic, so when you take a tour, instead of us telling you what happened that day with the soldier shooting out of the uh, attic window, you actually get to watch the soldier shooting out of the attic window. And the best part is, you always get to see a soldier die, because they love to die. Every 20 minutes, they die. <laughs> we have a hospital surgery area downstairs in the cellar uh, because finding those medical supplies, there are lists of Gettysburg hospitals after the battle. The Shriver House is not on them. I don't know if there were any doctors there, but there, that house was sitting empty after the battle. You got 23,000 wounded. It's raining cats and dogs. It's a huge house. It's got a 65-foot long bowling alley. It just is common sense that it had to be filled with wounded, and finding those medical supplies was what cl clinched it for me that it, and it was. Uh, we do a play that day in the parlor, and it's Hetty Shriver talking to some of her neighbors, Mrs. Pierce and Mrs. Garlic, and they're talking about how anxious everyone is in town, that you know the rumors are that they might be coming, they might be coming. So that's a cute way to introduce it. Uh, up s downstairs in Shriver Saloon, it's the only day of the year that the saloon is open for business. Uh, you can belly up to the bar and grab a, soup, a, a sarsaparilla or a root beer at the end of the tour. And this year we started something different that I'm really excited about. Oops, go back again. Uh, we started a Ladies' Aid Society booth on the sidewalk in front of the house. And we left papers and envelopes out there to ask people to write notes to wounded soldiers. And so we, oh my gosh, we had about 60 or 70 of them this, this year. And we just put them in envelopes and gave them to an organization who would pass them out to the soldiers. And it's kind of what they did back then, so it's a nice way to continue that. And let's see. If you all know Rob Gibson, uh, the very first year we did a reenactment, this was the year 2000, we lined up all the guys in front of the house. Rob rolled his beautiful wagon up the street and took a photograph. I could cry because right here was his wagon. Uh, and we cut it off, I'm not sure why. Um, this was funny, back in those days, this is a long time ago, we were still using answering machines that could be... Uh, what is the word, like nobody knows who's calling, you know, anonymous, thank you. And about, I, I just love that photograph so much that we started using it in a lot of our advertising and I got four anonymous messages on my answer machine. I cannot believe you're trying to pass that off as an original Civil War photograph. No, we're not. There was no Shriver Saloon sign at the time. Um, this man here, and there's actually a man here and that over there that I cut off. They're standing in front of the parking meters out front. And uh, the house next door in the big photograph, you can see the storm door. I don't think they had storm doors back then. And there was no house attached to this here. But we made sure that this house was in the photograph because we didn't want down the road 50 years from now people to see this and think that they found an original photograph. But most importantly, I really don't think the men had, stand, had time to stand in front of the house and take their picture taken. Yeah, but it is just such a cool photograph. So we do use that an awful lot. And that was from Rob Gibson. Uh, let's see here. Oh, some of the other activities that we do that day of the reenactment. These are some of the soldiers shooting upstairs in the, in the attic. That's our play that goes on in the parlor. Our medical people doing their thing and a young lady wrapping wounds or wrapping bandages. So it's a very, very fun day. We do one other special program at the Shriver House. We call it Five Christmases at the Shriver House. The Shriver House, the Shriver story, it is a sad story. It's a war story. Most stories like that are. But at Christmas time, we try to change everything up. This is the sitting room that's we called the rec rooms for the rest of the year, but we put it back for Christmas to make it look real, real pretty. And the Shriver family lived in this house for five Christmases. So what we do on each floor, we talk about how different they were. The first floor, the parlor, 
There's Miss Abby sitting over there in the corner, and there's Miss Abby right there giving a tour. Um, we have the whole first floor set up like they're having a big open house party because the family moved in just before Christmas in 1860. So we have liquor and gifts and food and wine and uh, food all over the first floor. It's really kind of fun because they had just moved in and life was grand. By the time 1861 Christmas comes along, George is off fighting in the war. So on the second floor, we talk about how you know, Hetty would have done the best she could, but it wasn't quite the same without George around, but she did what she could for Sadie and Molly. So on each of the floors, we talk about how different it was. This little guy right here, the turkey. <laughs> for many, many years, I had this little chicken. It was like this big. It looks like it would barely fit one, fill one person up. And uh, I had my, uh, I love fake food. I had my eye, oh, I did it again, <laughs> on that turkey. Uh, for a long, long time, but it was ridiculously expensive, and I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Well, at the end of 2020, after COVID, and what such a crappy year it was for all of us, I decided, oh, screw it. So I bought this great big turkey that looks like it would feed 14 people instead of the four little people that live inside the house, but it looks real, real pretty. Um, this is our, our shop windows at Christmas time. I just think they look pretty cool. A couple of years ago, I was approached by a woman who was doing a book on historic homes at Christmas time. And I'm very proud to say that she put in like three pages of pictures uh, from the Shriver House and put a little bit of our story inside there. So I'm happy and proud of that. The Shriver House is an ongoing restoration. Uh, some things you get to do for fun, like we would love. This is the same. Oh. <laughs> okay. The buttons are too close together on this thing. Um, some things are, would be for fun. This is the original wallpaper that, came, that we found in the parlor. This is it, too. We found a huge sample, a huge sample of wallpaper from Hetty's kitchen. And it is our dream that one day we would like to put those two both back into the house. Uh, most likely, the entire house was wallpapered. The Shrivers had money. It was in 1858 that they came out rather than hand-printed wallpaper, but they had rolled wallpaper. And the Shrivers had money, and they would have wanted to show that off. So we're very sure that everything would have wa We found other little tiny samples, but these were the biggest samples that we found. And this is my husband, Dell, painting the front door. So some things you get to do for fun, and some things you just have to do over and over and over again. We have filmed at the Schreiber House about 30 times. I am very proud the year the house was restored. We did win the State of Pennsylvania Historic Preservation Award. And for two young people who had no idea what we were doing, I was really quite proud of that. Uh, but we've been on all these different things and many, many other film productions. Uh, the killer is... It's never been the Shriver House or the Shriver Story. We're Appomattox, we're uh, just all different kinds of places that they use for the background. And one of the things they love, all these uh, producers love about filming at the Shriver House is uh, you can be in so many different locations and still be inside that same building because the attic looks so different than the parlor, the cellar looks so different than the other rooms, the kitchen is like being in a whole different house. So they really do like it. You may recognize some of these people he was with the park for a while, a while. Uh, this is Jerry Bennett, who was one of my heroes. Uh, Jerry wrote a little tiny book called Days of Uncertainty and Dread. And he had researched lots and lots of family stories of, of what families went through during the fighting. And before this whole entire project got started, I had lunch with Jerry, told him what we wanted to do. And I said, can I use the stories from your book? And he said, like I feel, he said, these are not my stories. These are our stories. He said, I would be honored if you would tell those stories. And that was before we discovered the story of the Shriver family. But uh, we still sell his book because he's, he was just such a great guy. And so this is some of the film. I love this one. It was called Lincoln at Gettysburg. It was on PBS. And uh, that's our parlor. And there's Lincoln right in, He was supposed to be. It was about how Lincoln was the very first president that had firsthand contact with the battle during the war because of the telegraphs. And it was very interesting the way they put the whole thing together. So that was pretty neat as well. And, ooh, one of my heroes, I'm sure many of you, I hope, are familiar with the history underground, J.D. Hewitt called me a few years ago and said he puts these little videos together on history and he wanted to come to the Shriver House and, and do a short video. And I ignored him three times. And uh, finally, my husband was looking at the email. He said, you know, this guy sounds legit. 
And he said, yeah, I don't want any money. And I thought, eh, all right. So he came and we spent a couple of hours in there and he videotaped the whole house. And we now have over 1 million views. It's unbelievable. He actually really has changed things for me and for the Shriver house. Uh, when it first came out, oh gosh, every single day, two, three, four times a day, I'd get a group of two or three or four men come in and we'd get to talking and yeah, I've been coming to Gettysburg for 30 years, five, six, 10 times a year. And I said, oh, then you've been to the Shriver house before. No, no, I've never been here. I said, well, in all those times, on one rainy day, when you've done every square inch of the battlefield, you wouldn't think to yourself, ah, what the heck, let's just give that place a try. And they all said, no. I said, well, why? And they said, oh, we always thought you talked about cooking and cleaning in the 1860s. And then the best thing in the whole world is they take a tour and they come back and they are blown away. I think one of the wonderful things that for the, about the Shriver House is it really and truly has something for everybody. It's nice to bring children through there because this family had two little girls that were seven and five years old. So you get to hear, you see their bedroom, their clothes, their toys, and you get to hear what children uh, um, experienced during the battle. It's a war story for sure, because George Shriver was in Cole's Cavalry. I mean, it definitely is a war story. But really and truly, a lot of it is about Hetty Shriver, who was 27 years old. So it's a good story for women as well. And as I said earlier, you don't even need to know anything about the, Shriver, or about the Civil War, because we're not talking about generals. We're just simply telling a story. So it really has something for everybody. And JD comes here to speak at the Historical Society on occasion. And if you ever get a chance to meet him, he just is a really, really, really nice guy. For many years, people kept telling me, I need to tell the Shriver story. So I finally, with help, wrote the Shriver story. One of the, uh, there was a man that worked at the Shriver house who was a retired librarian, and he really kept encouraging me. And uh, so finally, we decided to give it a shot. So I wrote it but he was sort of the editor and things, and it's a pretty good read. <laughs> but I give so much of that credit to Harry, because Harry's really the one who helped ma me make that look as professional as it does. And not only does it cover the Shriver story, but it talks about the restoration, the things that we found in the house, uh, how the whole thing came to be, kind of the things that I'm, I'm talking about today. There's another important book that we sell at the Shriver house, and that is, of course, the Tilly Pierce story. Uh, without Tilly Pierce, I wouldn't have the story that I do today to tell because, I mean, sometimes I get mad because everybody's like, oh, Tilly, 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 Tilly. Everything's wonderful about Tilly. Well, nothing happened to Tilly's house. And if it weren't for Hetty, Tilly wouldn't have had such an incredible story to tell. But I do thank God for Tilly every day because it's through her story is how we learned what happened to Hetty Shriver. We also sell another little book uh, for children. One of the ladies that works at the sh worked at the Shriver House, one of our very first tour guides, said she really wanted to write about a story, a children's story about the battle. And she asked if she could write a story about Sadie and Molly, so she did. So that's a cute little story as well. And um, I believe that is the Shriver story. <laughs> One more little thing I'd like to add. You all know Andrew Dalton. So a few years ago, Andrew got the position as the director of the uh, Historical Society. And like I do with anybody who's in that kind of a position, I called him and I said, geez, I'd love you to take a tour of the Shriver House. So he said, oh yeah, sure. So he came over and uh, it was just the two of us and we walked around and we chatted forever and we got, I gave him the tour and we got to Hetty's kitchen and he said, can I stop you for a moment? He gets probably tired of me telling this story, but it makes me very proud. I said, yeah, sure, what? And he said, I got to tell you something. He said, the reason I, meaning himself, the reason I do what I do today is because of you. I said, Andrew, I've never met you before, so how is that the case? Well, I've always invited the Adams or the uh, Gettysburg Area Middle School, which is just across the street from the Schreiber House, to come for a tour of the Schreiber House when those kids are in fifth grade, because I want those kids to understand that every day when they walk to school, they are walking on the battlefield. One of the things that's important to me to teach people who come here, the battlefield isn't just Pickett's Charge and Devil's Den and the Wheatfield. 
It's every single square inch of this town. Soldiers were killed in the attic of the Shriver's home. That is the battlefield. There were soldiers killed all over the streets of town and horses. I mean, we all know the things that happened inside the town. So it isn't just the outside of town, it's the inside. And I want those kids to know and learn that. And he said, well, Andrew said, I was in the very first class that came here. And uh, he said, and you were my tour guide. And he said, we went through the whole house, and we got back, we got to this kitchen, and he said, I said to myself, this is what I'm going to do one day. And he said to me that I am the godmother of the civilian experience in Gettysburg, because we were the first to talk about the civilians, and I couldn't be more proud that he has taken that story and run with it, because what they do here is talk about all the, what people went through in town, and I couldn't be more proud and excited and happy, and uh, we're going to work together, and I'm, I just couldn't be more happy. So, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the man who owned the property around 1905 decided to get rid of the bowling alley, so he tore it down, which is a sad thing. The only good thing is he added two tiny additions off the back of the house, which we were going to take away during the restoration, but if we did, we realized we would have no plumbing at all, <laughs> and we like that indoor plumbing thing there. But the only good thing is when he put all the modern stuff in the back, kitchens and bathrooms, and he never touched the original house. So today, it's the original floors, windows, handrails, doors, doorknobs. I touch those doorknobs, and I just imagine Hetty touching the exact same doorknob. is just amazing. So it was a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How long did it take? People hate the answer to this one. Right, right. Uh, we started the day after New Year's in 1996, and we opened up on the 4th of July in 1996. We are not Rockefellers. We needed to get the doors open as quickly as we could, and I'm not exaggerating. We did work six, seven days a week, 12, 14 hours a day. And then we opened up, and no one, and I mean no one, would come in for a tour. People would come in and say, oh, what time is the next ghost tour? Well, we don't exactly tell ghost tours, but the next tour is going to start at 2 o'clock, and they'd all do the same thing. All right, well, we'll be back. And they would never come back. For five years, we went in the hole, year after year after year. If it weren't for Mulligan McDuffer, that would have been gone, because that's what carried us for several years. Because we did all of this. We got no help, no funding. It was all out of our own pockets a lot more money than we actually had. And if anybody has ever done an old house, as you always know, it takes twice as long and, and costs twice as much as you thought it was going to be. And so Dell kept saying, why would you, you thought this was a good idea? Um, but nobody would come in. And on the fifth year, I went to my accountant back in Philadelphia, and he said, oh, Nance, he said, what's plan B for this house? He said, maybe you could make it another bed and breakfast. Maybe you could turn it into a gift shop. And I sat in his office, and I bawled my eyes out, and I said, I know it's going to work. I know it's going to work. And he said, well, <clears throat> let's just give it one more year. And if it doesn't work, you're going to have to come up with something else. So then all of a sudden, it started to turn. And in the beginning, People would not come in because we did not tell ghost stories, and now I'm very, very proud. People come in because we do not tell ghost stories. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. If you've ha can I ask how many people here have been to the Shriver House? Oh, my God, thank you. <coughs> thank you very, very much. I hope you'll come back again. Excuse me. Because... Every tour guide tells the same story, but we all tell it a little bit differently because I don't want it to be memorized kind of a thing. Uh, but if you haven't been, I hope that you will come and visit us because it isn't my story, it's their story, and it is a remarkable story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you all for coming out. And um, if you want to look at the Tilly book or the Shriver book, Nancy's got it. We've got it in the gift shop. If you want to ask questions, I'm sure Nancy could stay up here for a couple extra minutes and answer anything you have. But thank you again for coming out. <laughs>